Welcome to calculus. It's a very scary sounding word simply to mean this study of finding how graphs change. In this first section, exercise 16a, we are recognizing relationships. The purpose of this exercise is to really give you an idea of what's the point of graphs. The purpose of graphs are to model real life situations, whether it be an engineering uh, example where we're building something or a trigonometric example where we're determining temperature rising and falling. That is the point of graphs. In this example, I've got three bottles of various delicious beverages. Each one, the bottle is a different shape. And I need to describe if I was to pour in a liquid into each of these bottles, what would it look like as a graph? We'll start with the Fanta bottle on the left. I promise you I'm not getting paid by Fanta for this. So you'll see there it has a little sort of indentation at the bottom. So it's a little bit narrow at the bottom. It's sort of this fairly box-like. And then it comes in and goes out a bit and then comes back in again. So if I was pouring liquid, so you can imagine the H is the height of liquid. At first, for that little tiny indentation, it would go up very quickly. But then as it's... Uh, as we've got the sort of the wider part there, you know, it's fairly constant. You know, it's just probably, in fact, it's probably more of a straight line uh, over here. And then as you can see here, then it comes in a bit. So shoot up, the height and the volume will shoot up there. And then it will get a little bit wider and then it gets a little bit narrow at the top until we get to the bottle being filled. You'll notice there that my horizontal axis is V, so for volume. So as I'm pouring it in, you can almost use that V for time, which is common in these situations, but yeah, we're filling up with a volume. So with the uh, the San Pellegrino Canotto bottle here, we've got here, uh, you can see here, it's got a sort of narrower, it gets wider, narrower again. So we'll go up a smidgen, be fairly quick, but then it will generally increase uh, very slowly as we get around to the outside, and then it will narrow as it gets a little bit narrower, It'll end up looking something like this. So the, the, the flatter the curve, that means the slower it takes for the liquid to rise in height. And then the last one, we have uh, this carrot and lemon, Ooh, carrot and lemon uh, bottle here. Uh, it's a juice bottle here that's fairly rectangular and it's got a pointy bit at the top. So it's actually going to fa fill fairly consistently up until this top part here. And then it'll go whoop, like that. Now, there was nothing really mathematical about what I was drawing there. It was a very approximate shape. The purpose was is that if we've got an action of some kind where something is changing, in this case, as we're adding liquid, the volume of liquid, we're seeing the height, the liquid on the bottle, there is a change. And we can model that change. And sometimes it's important to be able to model the change so we can predict how things will happen, how uh, quickly a bottle will fill up or how quickly we can get a, an object to another particular surface, uh, all these kinds of things. So this is what this is the purpose of graphs. We're trying to see the rate of change. In the previous example, the rate was constantly positive. And why do I know it's positive? Because it was increasing, otherwise known as sometimes known as strictly increasing because I was filling up the bottle with liquid, I wasn't emptying it out at all, or there wasn't a hole in there. But what if the rates was uh, were changing, where it could decrease or increase depending on a situation? Well, I've got a scenario right here. The scenario is I've got a ball, it's 60 meters up, it's, I'm dropping it, and then it bounces after a short period of time. So sometimes you're asked to describe the rate of change. The rate of change is talking about the uh, how quickly, as I move across horizontally, how far it goes up or goes down. Sometimes this is referred to as the gradient. And later on, we also refer to a thing called the derivative, but that's, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it.
So I'm going to go and describe the rate of change as seen here in this graph. So you can see in this graph, it started here at 60 meters above the ground. That's these what D meters up here. And we're measuring against time. We've got the stopwatch and we're looking at this object bouncing. Uh, how do I know it's bouncing? Because it's going down to zero meters and it bounces back up here uh, at this to about 20, 23 meters high, uh, about almost 25 seconds later, and then it comes back down. So the way I would describe it, I would describe it with my normal people words, and then I would go and use my maths words. So just so I know what happens. So object starts 60 meters from the ground, and then it was dropped and hits the ground 10 seconds later. So that's what that 10 implies. It bounces up to, what did I say I was gonna, I know it was 22 meters. It's above the ground. At, uh, let's say it's about uh, uh, 23 seconds. Then it looks like it stops, then lands and stops. at 30 seconds. So how might I describe that in terms of rates of change? So I would use uh, some uh, words such as the object initial position is at 0, 60. And then The object's rate of change is decreasing until uh, 10, zero. So you notice that I use the word decreasing, sometimes we refer to as the graph being strictly decreasing, or sometimes we refer to the rate of change being negative. So you can also refer to this as a negative rate of change. Now, why is it negative? Why is it decreasing? Because all it's doing is it's just going very fast. Well, we define rate of change uh, by a very, very simple way, which is we take the height or the, the difference in, let's say, y value, divided by the difference in x value. So there's our rate of change. So it's the difference in the y value. So the fact is the fact that it's decreased in height from where it was initially, that's going to be a negative number because it's decreased. Um, and then as we move across, it's a positive uh, um, x value number. So therefore we've got a negative divided by a positive, it's going to be a negative number. And then you'll see here, uh, it sort of flattens out. So I can say the objects, I'm just gonna put ROC, remember that I mean rate of change, I don't mean it's some sort of rock thing. Uh, an object's rate of change is zero at zero, uh, 10 zero, Ooh, 10 zero. So when it's gone flat, it means the rate of change is at zero. Then the object's rate of change is increasing, or you could say positive, until, and I'm gonna be approximate here, 23, 22, so 23 seconds later, it's about 22 meters high. It flattens out here as well. 
So we can go back to saying the object rate of change is zero at 2322. And then finally, in that final gasp there, the object's rate of change is decreasing after or when t is greater than 23. So that's how we describe things in terms of rates of change. You can either use negative, positive, uh, decreasing or increasing. You'll find that all of those words are used simultaneously. So if you start seeing where is the graph strictly increasing, you know that's when it's the positive slopes. If you see where, if you're asked where is the graph, the graph strictly decreasing, then you'll ask for where the negative slopes are. Now in that previous example, I was being very approximate with everything. I, I was saying it was increasing, it was decreasing or whatnot. Can we actually physically calculate how much that rate, uh, what that rate is. You'll know there I mentioned that the rate is the difference in the Y values divided by the difference in the X values. You might also vaguely remember that that it comes from year nine when we had linear graphs and that is how we go and calculate the gradient. Well, we if we had a quite a linear looking graph, we can actually physically calculate those rates of change. I've got an example here of a particle that's moving at, a ver at various constant rates. And this time we can actually physically calculate it. So uh, here it's uh, the, uh, the distance here is 60 meters away from the origin. And then uh, again, it's 10 seconds later and then it bounces up to 20, 20, and then it goes a bit flat here. So we can actually describe this in various sections. So I'm going to get my little highlight. I'm going to start with here. Is, and now we can actually calculate it. So the way you might, if you've forgotten how to calculate a gradient, we use the symbol M for gradient, and it's Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. So this is 10, 0. This is 0, 60. So we can do 0, take away 60 over 10 take away zero, I think it's negative 60 over 10, which is at negative six. Um, and it's, in this case, we want the, uh, the units for this one as well. And since it's decreasing betas for every second, it's uh, decreasing by negative, it's uh, rate of change is negative six meters per second. Or, you can actually write this as, or decreasing by six meters per second. If you say decreasing by negative six, that's actually a tautology is basically you're saying it's decreasing by a negative, which means if it's decreasing by a negative, it's actually increasing. So use either one of those phrases. And then we've got this positive here is uh, 20 take, uh, well, this is 2020, and that is 10, zero, well, I've already got that labeled there, 10, zero. So 20 take away zero over 20 take away 10, which is equal to 20 over 10, which is two meters per second. And then you'll notice it's flat here. So it's, and it stays here at 30, 20. Over 30 take away 20, which is zero divided by 10, which is zero meters per second. Zero meters per second. So what does that mean? What, uh, what else can we say? Well, we can say the particle is, it's not, if it's not, if it's rate of change is zero meters per second, then um, the particle has stopped. So therefore, we have thoroughly described the movement of this particle.